Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Sarah Cornish. I'm the Senior Director at Games for Change. If you don't know Games for Change yet, we are a nonprofit that supports game creators and social innovators making games that drive real-world impact and learning. We are very excited to welcome you to our very um, to our live industry circle question and answer session with Filament Games and iCivics. Today we have Dan Norton and uh, Carrie Ray Hill of Filament Games and iCivics, respectively, uh, for a discussion about designing impactful civic learning games and the stewardship that helps um, help stay bipartisan in designing such games. So we'll be running a Q&A using the YouTube chat tool. Um, so on the upper right of your screen next to the YouTube video that you're watching, you can actually enter in questions that we'll be moderating and asking to, um, to Dan and Carrie uh, after they shed some wisdom um, for us. Um, and to give a, a little bit of background on the industry circle, so the Games for Change Industry Circle is in its second year. Um, this initiative highlights companies and entrepreneurs that are emerging as leaders in the impact game sector. Um, by sharing their methods and best practices and different lessons learned, um, we hope to inspire others in our growing community. So Film and Games was part of this, um, this initiative last year and is part of the second year. Uh, the Industry Circle also includes Shell Games, Brain Pop, and Playmatics. So we're really excited to have you guys here today. Um, a little bit of background on Filament. Uh, Filament Games is a game studio that exclusively creates learning games and is one of the founding members of our industry circle. The company's games combine best practices in commercial game development with key concepts from the learning sciences. Filament has partnered with companies worldwide to deliver best-in-class learning games, uh, VR and AR experiences, as well as training simulations. So Filament Games has created uh, their own award-winning suite of science and math games that has also been implemented in districts across the country. So Dan and Carrie, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to pass over to you guys to talk a little bit about your work, um, share some insights, and then we will move to the Q&A. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so that's a, that was an awesome intro for Filament. Um, I think, Gary, do you want us to give an overview of iCivics? Sure. Um, we were founded, or we became iCivics in 2010. Uh, we were called Arcorts before that, and there's a long origin story, but the short of it is um, look around, civic education wasn't really getting served properly. Um, our kind of fairy godmother founder, um, retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, looked around and thought she could probably find some solutions to this problem. So long story short, we ended up getting together. <laughs> We've made 19 games. Uh, we have 150 lesson plans that are also free on the site. Our games are also free. Uh, some learning tools with literacy and civics combined. Um, really kind of focused on serving the civic education community in basically grades 4 through 12. Uh, we're using community colleges and universities as well, which is sweet. <laughs> not not intended, but pretty awesome. Um, and our mission is just really to engage students in democratic learning and kind of create awesome citizens out of it. So mm -hmm. that's the short version of the yep. story. <laughs> yeah, Filament, uh, Filament partnered with the yeah, iCivics not quite right out of the gate, but our course was really just sort of getting yeah. itself sorted out. And uh, our main connection actually was that um, there's a uh, professor James Paul G uh, is a pretty well known games and learning researcher, uh, and he actually wound up being an advisor and, and actually was part of getting Sandra Day O'Connor to get interested in the idea of doing games and learning. And uh, Jim uh, brought us on when our course was sort of pivoting towards saying let's start doing learning game experiences, and that's. Is that a decade? Nine years? We're getting there. Yeah, We're getting very close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a long time ago. And uh we don't like a day over three years together, but yeah. <laughs> I remember I remember when Jim brought us in, he was like, just so you know, guys, at that time it was just basically me, Dan White, and Alex Tyson. Just so you know, guys, if you mess this up, I will kill you. Um, <laughs> so we had a it was a really, really fantastic opportunity for filament. We were just getting 
uh, just getting started, and so being able to, to partner with Sandra Day O'Connor and a bunch of people who wanted to make really great stuff that had a real impact. Um, and we're really, uh, right out of the gate, they're really dedicated to the idea of making things that kids wanted to experience, real, engaging stuff. Yeah. Uh, it was it was like a perfect partnership, and we just until a couple of like maybe a, a year and a half ago, we just sort of kept going. Like we just were like, well, it makes sense to make more stuff, and yep. just kept on new topics to cover, etc. And then yeah, in the last two years or so, uh, filament and high civics set up sort of an ongoing rolling uh, relationship where high civics sort of just has a filamenty people available at all times. And then also uh, the sweet thing we got out of the deal is we got Carrie now installed in our office. So uh, she can uh, she can be the first person to see the various things I find on the internet every day. Yes, and, it's delightful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah, I think that's kind of like the, the history of our setup. So I became embedded with filament um, just a little over a year ago. Um, as the content area specialist and the person kind of leading the charge for the game development with iCivics. Um, I was on the phone, I was doing Google Hangouts, you know, lots of Google Docs together, which is a great way to collaborate. Um, but when it came down to it, <clears throat> we were looking to move from the East Coast back to the Midwest, and I fell in love with Madison and these guys, so it seemed like a natural fit. And now, again, I get to enjoy his internet browsing practices mm -hmm. as his neighbor, mm -hmm. and um, also just basically instead of scheduled calls and stuff, I just might go to somebody's desk and be like, hey, so about that, or you know, we can pop back and forth to each other. So that's been a huge advantage, efficiency and collaboration. Um, we did that really well anyway, but now I get to do it to your face yep. with cheese curds. Yep. Um, also another major motivating factor for me. Another key perk. Yeah. I think one thing that's one thing we identified right out of the gate is nice is that even well, so when filament starts a project, there's there's some sort of gauge of like how how smooth is this client relationship going to be? Like, are they game literate? Do they know us? Have we made stuff with them before? Um, are they technology literate, etc.? And so like iCivics has always been like the the gold star standard for us in terms of those things. They've always since the get-go, have intrinsically understood the value of games. They've always been dedicated to being very practical about how to make things that have a real impact in classrooms. So, so they've always been great on that front. But even so, um, if you're working with a client that's far away, often uh, if you get an hour turnaround on a question, that's good for a, for a remote client. Yeah. Oh, great! I found that out in an hour. That was nice. Um, getting something back after a day is normal. But with Carrie here, we can have instantaneous instantaneous <laughs> answers. We can we can just drag her into a room, and be like, "Carrie, we broke the game. How do we fix it?" And that just works. So the acceleration of collaboration with her here is ridiculously good. Um, one thing that on the agenda we're also supposed to talk about were disadvantages. I don't think there's any disadvantages. That's just been lovely. We've already talked about curds, so it's yeah. yeah <laughs> I got, got nothing. Got I got nothing to complain cheese. about. Yeah. Nothing to complain about. Yeah. Do you like your apartment? I do. Yeah. All right. So yeah, everything's good. Looking to buy a house. I like it here so much. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna get rid of me anytime soon. Nice. Another really nice thing about the client client relationship that we have with the being uh, knowledgeable is because I became knowledgeable because of you guys. Um, I actually bought my first gaming console when I got hired at iCivics because I didn't know much. Mm. I didn't play much. Embarrassing. It's true. Um, but you guys are very, very good, and I would say this for anyone who makes games and works with clients, is that the more you can teach your clients, mm -hmm. um, the more they're probably going to want to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I learned so much in this process over the last seven years that um, you know I was given a game design Barbie for Christmas, and I was just like, I almost feel that I'm getting to the point where I've maybe earned this a little, just a little. Um, but I've learned a lot, and it's because the folks here at Filament are, are teachers at heart. They may not be teachers by certification or whatever, but um, if I have a question, they answer it. If I don't have a question, they still offer the why rather than just the what. So I think, again, the instantaneous stuff, but even the last six years of developing, 
with film, it has been really, really awesome in that there is no lack of sharing or problem solving together. Um, it's not like a closed box I just get to peek into every week for a call. So mm -hmm. props to y'all for that. <laughs> All right. Well, here, let's talk about uh, next is uh, the state of the platform and its mission. So I think that is iCivics. Yep. Um, I, let's see, I definitely have opinions about the first part, but in terms of like the the urgency of the platform, do you want to talk about that? I have so it's an it. interesting time to be in civic education. Yes. Um, it's always been interesting if you're nerdy like me, um, but basically um, we approach, our approach has even become interesting. Um, we've approached it from a nonpartisan, not even a bipartisan, which may seem like it's a very fidgy little thing to, to differentiate between. But really, when you look at civics, um, the systems of government, if you ever took a government class in high school, it's usually very dry, very boring, like here's how things work, here's what the Constitution says, here's all the processes and mm -hmm. systems and blah, 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 right? That may not seem important, but it is. And I think the last, honestly, 15 years have proven that this is kind of a big deal. Um, and it just becomes more and more urgent as we go through it. Um, so we really look at this from a nonpartisan meeting. Like we don't just look at the two party sides of things. We don't just look at the drama. We really look at the systems. And civics is a perfect systems based structure that, which is also why the games work so well, is because games navigate systems. Civics navigates a system. So we really try, and I think our last two games that have come out. Kind of reinforce that is when the White House, which is how do you run and win a presidency, and then executive command is what the heck do you do once you get there? And so we don't like sensationalize with personalities or specifics. We really look at here's the thing. Here here's what what it's all about, and you know the details and the process gives kids a lot of uh, of ability to kind of compare that to what they see in the news or what they read or you know what's being discussed at home um, and that's kind of the goal is that we're really facilitating a baseline that so much more can happen all around it so it's again I've always thought it was urgent but th those of us in the civic education community would say like duh always but again you can't turn on the internet <laughs> without seeing this getting talked about on every Every format, every every channel, everywhere, um, you know, every everywhere you go, it's there. So we just hope to kind of provide that baseline information and the foundation for understanding the United States government system as much as we can, and have fun while doing so. I would say um, there is iCivics historically has had been an interesting spot where. They are talking about the function of government and how government works. And while, I mean, a tremendous amount of effort goes into making that not a political discussion, it is, of course, true that politics have opinions about how government should function and sometimes if government should function at all. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been very, it's consistently challenging on every project mm -hmm. to try and provide not only something that is balanced, uh, that offers a systems approach, like Harry said, mm -hmm. that offers like, well, this is how it works, but to look for uh, ways to make that itself not appear to be biased. Uh, because, yeah, because there are, there, you have critics where, you know, that. Well, I mean, you can log into any internet forum today and find people saying whether or not they think the electoral college should exist, yep. right? So if we make a game uh, called Win the White House that has electoral college, uh, we'll get someone being like, I'm offended that you put the electoral college in this game. The electoral college is a sham, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so even just representing how government functions, and mm -hmm. especially if we imply that government should function, <laughs> uh, gets uh, is a consistent, a consistent hot water yep. pool that we're in. And so there's gaps. And games are awesome and do so much. But you know, you can't play a game every day, all day. I mean, we'd love it if we could. <laughs> you know, in this world. But in in our other materials that we make, like the lesson plans and all the facilitated game guides and discussion guides, we really want to help um, 
use the games, like the fact that electoral college exists in our game because it exists in real life, um, we facilitate conversations around that. So the kids can bring their understandings, other experiences, other classroom materials, and the teacher's kind of guidance to, dis to d discuss and debate it. Because those are the like really core important skills that are harder to put into a game, but we provide the fodder for mm -hmm. that kind of practice of skill as well. So um, basically our curriculum is, again, 19, 19 or 20 games, over 150 lesson plans, and we really kind of see this ecosystem of instruction where you can kind of modulate based on your classroom setup, your kids' interests, your personal interests as a teacher, and with great flexibility. There is no right way to do iCivics. It's like if I used to teach, so like I Frankensteined everything that we ever had or ever received. I made it work for my kids, and I know that good teachers do that. So mm -hmm. a game could be used to introduce a topic, wrap up a topic, get in the middle, remind them before an assessment maybe. Um, but it's there's no right or wrong way to do a game. And I, that's what I love about our content, yeah. especially the games, is like you can't screw this up. Yeah. You, you, even just playing it alone like in your bedroom at night as homework is great. But when you can really facilitate the discussion and um, deeper learning or curiosity that comes out of that and you know push the kids into research and things like that, that's just that's really hard to do with a lot of other formats. So we, mm -hmm. we run with it when we can. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, iCivics, just in terms of the thinking around usability, in terms of how do real teachers use this in real classrooms, mm -hmm. and how will they approach and put it in in different places, like makes, I think is part of why iCivics has become so ubiquitous, mm -hmm. right? Like I think there's lots of times people approach uh, game-based learning or even ed just educational technology as like we build the tech and now we are done then we assume that people will flock to this amazing widget or software mm -hmm. and they will figure out all of the other problems about what it means to implement this in whatever impact mm -hmm. space they're in mm -hmm. um, but iCivics has always taken the reins on saying we will we are going to work with and create dialogue with teachers everywhere about how to make these things work. Um, and that's why there's teachers like in every single state. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I think it's not hyperbole to say that iCivics is one of, if not the most successful game based learning tool, like content curriculum to, out there, right? There's not, there's not a lot of things like iCivics that are just. They cover this topic with games so well and so thoroughly with such a big impact. And for free. I mean, that's the other major thing, right? We've got uh, 52 million gameplays since 2010, which is pretty awesome. We just had 4 million in November alone of last year during the election season. So it's getting used. Um, we have 155,000 registered teachers um, and over 40 million site visits. So, like, we're, we're we're talking to teachers, we listen to teachers, we try to like just facilitate that from both the grassroots and as much, you know, communication, as many communication channels as we can. So um, our goal is just to keep that up, continue to engage with mm -hmm. classrooms, um, innovate, right, and engage with like what's next for ICFX? So like we're just gonna keep listening. We're gonna keep innovating, we're gonna keep figuring out what the need is, how can we address that need, how can we use technology to, and, and fun to address that need, mm -hmm. and then just continuing making stuff um, um, is our goal. And the other thing too is with technology, like you mentioned, um, we are in the process of moving all of our original Flash-based games into Unity because you know when we started, the iPad thing wasn't a thing <laughs> really. Right. right. <laughs> um, you know we weren't, we couldn't future-proof. Like tech can't be future proof. This is, I mean, this is a non tech person saying it, but it can't be. And so classrooms, we found, tend to also be lagging three or four years behind of whatever, mm -hmm. you know, is the hot new thing. Um, and so really finding that balance of like, where are classrooms? Where are teachers with their technology? Yeah. Um, do you have an iPad? Okay, how old is that iPad? What, what Internet Explorer 7? Are you still using that? <laughs> okay. I mean, that, that's the sad reality, right? Of, mm -hmm. of, the IT departments that are usually overwhelmed in schools. So another reason we've been successful is because you guys work with us to figure out what the state of affairs are. We make things that both meet teachers where they are with their technology, but then also kind of help them 
move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now we're moving into like making these really popular games apps, and it's a process because there's a lot of work behind it, but it's it's valuable work. So I think we have five games now that are on app, um, which is great. Um, and that was all popular demand, basically, from the teachers. Yeah. I know outside of iCivics, there's a period of time where Philom was still working in Flash, where like the uh, the death knell had already been sounded. Right? Right. We already knew the Flash was uh, entering a long and still going twilight. Yeah. Um, but and we would get occasionally we get criticized or even lose work because we're like we we think Flash is the right tool for this. But if you want to say what was the actual platform that a teacher could use in a classroom by the time we would make the product at that time, it was still Flash. <laughs> Right? It was still, they were not ready. They did not have hot rod graphic computers. Uh, tablets still at the time could barely hack things. So uh, inside educational games, there's always a really interesting push and pull yes. of what, when's the appropriate time to pivot your tech. Um, if you can stay cool, it's actually like you get kind of a crystal ball mm -hmm. because there's like a a three to five year lag between schools and the rest of what people think of contemporary tech. So if you just don't panic, you actually have this beautiful ramp to like see the future <laughs> of technology in schools because it's it's well it's like yeah it's three years three five years yeah, uh, yeah. behind. Um, so sometimes it's nerve wracking. Sometimes people want to make the thing that is uh, maybe doesn't fit actual deployment, but you know is further out ahead. I get that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's actually the right answer, right? If you plan on having a thing around that long or or you want to make a proof of concept to lead the way, mm -hmm. those are cool. But yeah, it's it's just a really interesting component where you have to balance innovation with real impact. How much do you want it to actually be used? Um, and that's uh, that actually ties a lot to like contemporary thinking about mm -hmm. VR and AR, right? We're in this spot where there's just a ridiculously cool field of innovation in front of us. Um, but thinking about how those things can be practically deployed uh, in learning environments. Like, I don't have room at my apartment for a Vive. Mm -hmm. And you, I'm probably pretty close to like the dream demographic, <laughs> right? Uh, so. Uh, thinking about how the tech actually can really reach out for real impact uh, is just a constant interesting yep. problem. Anyway, sorry, I got a little, got a little No, no, down. it's yeah. it's the truth. We yeah. we it's a it's a balance. Like we don't have the luxury of being like super high tech, mm -hmm. but we also can't just rest on our laurels and be like we made it. It's fine. Go on. <laughs> All right. Do you want to? Um, I think we should talk about. Uh, let's talk about the double PP method, <laughs> and then uh, then we can switch to questions. You're so much better at branding than I am. <laughs> well done. Yes. Um, uh, when people kind of ask, how do you approach games? How do you make games? How do you make games with impact, especially? Um, and I define the word impact as both like the look on the kid's face, the weird quietness that kind of falls over a computer lab, the kids getting grounded for getting caught playing video games at night when they're not supposed to be, but it's iCivics. That's only happened a couple times, but I love the story. Um, that's kind of my definition of like lowercase impact. Um, uppercase, I would say, is more like research stuff, and that's a whole other conversation. But I, I really broke it down to four, four terms, and because I'm a teacher at heart, I alliterated. Mm -hmm. um, purpose, right? A good, impactful game has to really have a reason for mm -hmm. existing. And our reason for existing, all of our games are to serve learning objectives. So teachers will probably be nodding their heads of like, yep, I have standards I have to hit. That's what determines what I do and don't do in the classroom. Because you only have so much time in a day. And so really, if my games don't serve really clear learning objectives, then we're everyone's wasting everybody's time at that point. So we want to make sure it's, it's really purpose driven. Um, the next thing would be once we have our learning objectives figured out is what is the process? And so really having these learning objectives and matching them to the right mechanics. Not every standard is going to be a game. Not every learning objective is going to make sense in a game, right? There's content and then there's skills. And so we got to find a happy space. 
So making sure, and this is where I've learned so much, is like I need the kids to learn this particular skill of you know delegating laws to the federal departments. Um, well, there's a mechanic for that, right? And so we make that mechanic, and that's executive command. As far as you receive a law, you sign it or veto it, and then you delegate that law. Um, so really kind of just being smart about not kitchen sinking a game, yeah. not trying to put too much in it, yep. but also not making it so simple that you're not quite sure why you're there. So yeah. mechanics have to meet objectives. Um, the next is practicality. We've talked about this actually just with the tech conversation is, is it going to work in a classroom? Can I literally just go down to the high school down by my house and walk in and be like, oh no, they don't, they have one computer from 1997. Mm -hmm and it doesn't even have a browser that works you know mm -hmm. that that's extreme and not likely to happen anymore but at the same time like will it fit into a class period all of my civics games are played within a 45 minute period they save you know like you can come back to it because the fire alarm goes off something happens whatever um and what are the use cases so we're really listening to the teachers half of our staff have been teachers so we really think about like what's the practicality of the game we you know we originally did some really massive thing that never really got yes. the full light of day. Guardian of Law. Guardian of Law, right? right? Is it a move? Or no, what was That's it? actually worth dipping into the history yeah. archives a bit. So one of the first things that we proposed while working uh, with iCivics was a game called Guardian of Law. And we were really taking kind of like almost a, uh, a MMO type approach where we were going to make one giant play space where you would have all types of different sorts of civic professional practice gameplay activities and roll them into one big role play experience. Um, and we presented that, and it was actually uh, Alan Gershenfeld. Ah. Alan Gershenfeld was like, hey guys, this game looks awesome. Definitely should not make that game <laughs> uh, because it is huge and it is all your eggs in one basket. And you should really think about breaking apart the objectives into smaller games, and then through that, explore, find a style, find a brand. Um, I was so mad that day. <laughs> I was like, oh, Gershenfeld! Um, but uh, he was super right. He was super duper right. Uh, and uh, that was uh, actually really uh, great advice. I'm super glad we took it. Mm. And. Uh, and you know, and we built now like now we have this army of games, yes. right? And it's true, we identify the style and a theme and iCivics as a feel and a brand that grew out of from a constant experimenting with mm -hmm. with how it's going to mm -hmm. look and work. Um so that's an example of kind of not meeting those first three yeah. <laughs> initially yeah, 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 with yeah. a great idea. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah. And then playability is kind of the duh thing for games. Is it fun? Is it engaging? Um, I have to say there are tons of learning games out there that are not fun, <laughs> not engaging. Um, sometimes they're great for kill and drill. Sometimes they, they serve another function entirely. But just because it's digital, just because it has cartoony looking things and content that's related to some kind of learning standard does not make it playable, does mm -hmm. not make it super fun. We also really focus on how to make games replayable because we find that a lot of times kids might get assigned in class or access access the game first, mm -hmm. but what they do is they go then and play it on free time, at home, whenever they, they can, and usually the more you play, the more you learn, and so we, we cover the bases in the first play, but we add uh, like elements and exposure to different content experiences by making it kids want to replay. Totally. And the last one I just threw, a fifth one is the partnership, which was why we're here and what we've been talking about, so I won't go into that. A fifth P. So figure that one out with oh, little, little jokes. Oh. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but that I mean the partnership I think is super critical. And to that end I just say it's all about sharing a mission, sharing a goal, sharing a drive. I think this would have been a little bit more difficult to work with like a non learning game company, right? Because a lot of the the lessons and the things that we share are because we both value learning, we value teachers, which sounds like a duh, but I think a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at kids as um, agents in the process is also really important. Yeah. Um, so. All right. Do you think should we should we pivot to questions? Because we got a whole bunch of questions now. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, all right. I'm going to go with. Uh, let's see. Question from Andrew Reed. Um, 
How do you measure impactfulness for both immediate impact and longitudinal impact? And do you find any difference between the two? Uh, so that's an awesome question. iCivics website has, has, a, has a nook with researchy stuff talking mm -hmm. about impact of games. Uh, they've got a variety of different studies looking at different types of accomplishment, I think both in terms of, of both those things, immediate and longitudinal. Okay. Um, and yeah, they are very, very different. Um, uh, I think the uh, when you talk about immediate impact, usually immediate impact uh, is more often measured in conventional assessment things like retention. So maybe a pre and post test is a is a way you might get a get a go off for immediate impact. And to be honest, like games can do that, but they're not quite as good as that as, for example, flashcards. Like if you need to know a thing and then say that thing a day later, it's hard to beat a flashcard. Um, so games can contain content like that, and you can retain it and speak it. But what games are really good at is creating a context for content where you have to see the, the entire machine spins in every gear. And rather than just a flat list of things remembered, you remember how that content works together, how one topic touches another one, how one thing is important sometimes and not important at another point. Like you, you, you actually turn the information into tools that you can use to think with. That's really what games are about. So that obviously speaks more to what are sort of the more longitudinal mm -hmm. measurements of like, does someone think that they've gained competency in a field or have they been able to sort of rethink of their identity as someone who's capable of doing something they couldn't do before? Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of the big difference. And, and so we're often in a tough spot where uh, we have to give both. Mm -hmm. Like people want short-term impact because it's easier to measure uh, and it's very easy to count. Yep. You're like, ah, they got six better at this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's good. Um, and then longitudinal often becomes more complicated. So you have to make a more complicated claim and stake about what's happening there. So. I will say from the civics perspective, um, longitudinally, we don't have like that, like, I don't know what a 25 year old's doing now, or you know, that it was introduced when we were 15. But our hope and our goal is by engaging them in these little moments mm -hmm. and giving them agency within the game, like they are the president, they do run for office, they do make laws in the games, is that if you can see yourself have agency in a game, I would I, I'm going to presume that you're going to see yourself having agency in the real world or being able to kind of translate that. So basically just by seeing, seeing yourself in spaces that you wouldn't ordinarily get to see yourself in, mm -hmm. that is a big kind of goal. Um, and I'd love $5 million to figure that out and <laughs> see if it happens because that's the thing about longitudinal studies. It's very expensive. Yeah. I would say uh, I, gave a, I gave a talk at uh, UW Madison within this last year and after the talk, uh, a student came up to me and was like, when I was in middle school, we played Do I Have a Right? And it said that you had a constitutional right to like not have your locker searched. But mm -hmm. we looked it up, mm -hmm. and you do not. Mm -hmm. I was like, first off, like congratulations, you, <laughs> you recreated the argument yes. we had yep. in the office. Yep. And two, I'm so stoked that you guys went to like go look up law <laughs> based right, on we, your game. And problem. we get enough emails from students who either ask about which case law we're referencing, which mm -hmm. we do, mm -hmm. um, or engaging us with like, why aren't there more female avatars here, or, you know, mm -hmm. male avatars or different things. Like, they're not just playing the game. They're they're looking at our ecosystem and going like, why? Or what what are your choices here? Or like, why did you do what you did? And that shows a whole nother level of engagement yeah. that I, I couldn't have asked for or even assumed would happen. So um, anyway. Yeah. Okay, next is Andrew Reed again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Twofer. Yeah. Is your platform US specific or do you cover civic topics can be used within non US civic systems? So we are used, I mean, we are an American government course, right? Or, or you know, curriculum. But we have some units on like the foundations of government, which is broad speaking and all over the world. Um, we have some comparative lessons as well. So I, and I, I have teachers and I've worked with teachers that are all over the world in teaching both American schools and um, in international schools that use us for different purposes. So again, with a Frankenstein, get in there, look around, see what you think. 
Um, and I definitely wouldn't tell you not to check it out. It's we just don't cover like parliamentary processes very deeply, or or you know different different um, international governments as much. Okay, Austin Merritt. When designing titles, how do you balance the different understanding of games and media that teachers and their students have? That's a really cool question. Um, and I would say it's even actually a little trickier than that because when you're making a game for a classroom, even students don't have a uniform opinion or expectation of games. Um, most, most people these days play games, but the types of games they play where they play them and how they play them are still ridiculously different. Mm -hmm. So um, we still have to think about trying to make games super broadly accessible uh, with a wide level of technological and gameplay literacies. Yep. Um, if there's any big divide, or actually no, the biggest piece of cognitive distance we have often, I think, is that the initial thing that teachers come to game-based learning for is Fun. They're like, this is fun. Mm -hmm. This will be something fun for the kids, mm -hmm. uh, and they will enjoy doing this. And that is that is true, mm -hmm. right? But the actual uh, that is that is the first thing that's nice about game-based learning. Um, and if you don't have the literacies to sort of say like, well, is this an authentic embedding of objectives? Like, is there real play happening in mm -hmm. here that actually is impactful? you can wind up with teachers bringing in really bad games into the classroom, yeah. like really poor quiz games and skill and drill things mm -hmm. and like things that really are just kind of like multiple choice. Right, um, there's just a lot of bad stuff out there. <laughs> yeah, so we actually spend a lot of time wanting to talk to teachers and try to raise the literacy of like what makes a learning game a good game and a good learning mm -hmm. tool. Um, and that is sort of the big, uh, the big spot. Um, the question implies a balance. Uh, I don't actually think there's any tension here. Like a good learning game actually is a win-win for everyone in the classroom, and uh, and as long as both those audiences have an appreciation for what means to be a good game, and how, then we're in business. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I think Sarah was gonna moderate a couple more questions that have come in for us. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, and there, there were a few questions that came in over, um, over the RSVP form. Um, so I just wanted to make sure a few of those get answered. Mm. Um, and to all of you who are tuned in, if we run out of time before your question gets answered, we can absolutely share answers with you via the YouTube page or even over email. Um, I'm sure Carrie and Dan would be happy to uh, to follow up. I can so, learn. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have some time. We don't have to, we don't have okay, to like, cool. chop it off. Awesome. Uh, so, so Nick Parr from the College of New Jersey asked, um, how do you see games being implemented in the classrooms of the future? So I'd love to hear, especially you, Dan, what does is, what is your classroom of the future look like? Ooh, right. OK. Ooh. So I have opinions about that. <laughs> Not to shock you. Um, I think uh, one of the things that when I first started making games for learning, my initial quest was to make games that could reach out to the Dan Norton of the past and make him less bored in school. That was my original mission, being like, there's, there's kids out there who are just dying in their chairs because they don't feel any way they're not actually being connected to learning. Um, and we need to make new, more innovative, deeper, interesting tools to like connect kids with content in ways where they feel like they have a purpose. Um, that has changed over time. Um, I now realize that like the Dan Nortons, they're going to be OK. Uh, like they're running a game company, no big deal. They're, they're gonna fine. be all right, right? right. <laughs> and that I think nowadays I'm more interested in games as tools for equity mm. for underprivileged kids. That's the thing. I was like, if anything, my problem was I was overprivileged, right? That was I had too much thing swimming in my head from being able to hang out at home and play video games and read books and mm -hmm. pursue hobbies and yeah, I was like so. 
I no longer feel like I need to make products that shape schools to facilitate the overprivileged. I'm now interested in can we make games to serve the underprivileged? And can we make games that give opportunities to people that they couldn't have otherwise? Um, create new safe spaces for learning. Uh, let people approach topics that might be things that they're not comfortable with, aren't in their social sphere. Um, and so that's, that's a really big part of it. Um, I think that uh, that's a big part of the future of schools. Is I feel like schools are one of the last remaining establishments that really are some focus on global sense of equity for citizens, right? They're, I mean, schools have turned into places where we make sure that kids just get food, right? Like they, like they really are one of these conduits right now. They're one of the last standing establishments and uh, where we actually hold up a banner and say that, that there's a standard we expect American children to have. Um, so I want schools to be able to fulfill that process uh, and fulfill that vision as much as possible. Um, I, I'm in terms of specific pedagogy in the school of the future. Obviously, I really like uh, project-based learning, like connecting people to the idea that doing things is a great way to learn. Um, obviously, I uh, I'm interested in integrations of STEM literacies across everything, which I think is sometimes considered. I've actually been on both sides. I've heard the pushback of like, we're talking too much STEM and not enough literacy. But I think that uh, getting people to be able to think critically and approach problems as engineering problems, um, uh, or even just being able, getting people to actually think that they can solve problems uh, <laughs> would be a thing I would love if everyone was given those tools uh, in school. Um, and there's one other thing, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to almost betray myself. I also think that if we could get schools so that everyone can learn to love to read, uh, not just they read three things, but like get everyone to love to read uh, would be a beautiful part of the school of the future. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, that's my list. Carrie. I, I think just having engagement, right, and valuing every single person in that classroom, from the teacher to a teacher aide to the kid. Um, and those people within that classroom knowing they're valued and what the work they're doing, both the student work and the teacher work is valued. Um, to me, that's great. And I think the role of games in both of our scenarios is really a facilitative device um, to, to reach those ends, right? To reach equity, to reach, to bring in content and skill development and um, agency. I think games, again, there is no silver bullet to education. We would have done it by now if there was. But I do think that the games can play a role in kind of providing an arc of experience to do literally everything that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the food part, but that's yeah. <laughs> they, can that's design, they can design their menu. Yeah, kids game, gotta eat. Perhaps. Great. Thank you. Um, cool. Okay, next one is from Patty Van Reckham. Uh, she gave us a couple of questions beforehand and has also asked some via the YouTube chat. Um, so Patty is very interested in um, uh, behavior change versus just skill building and improving knowledge. So mm -hmm. can you guys talk a little bit about sort of if and how you design games that aim for behavior change? And and, um, and Carrie, if you guys are interested in exploring that in the iCivics um, platform. Yeah, and so it's complicated. Um, there is a, uh, I think there's an interesting dichotomy that isn't often talked about with behavior games. There's sort of two ways to approach it. You can make games that have like an embedded practice of being like, this is how you do the thing. Um, so like, let's say uh, we wanted to make a game about weight loss, or let's, let's make it, it's really hard to make a game about not doing something, so let's make it better. Let's do a game about making healthy food choices. Let's do that, right? So you can have a game where you create an identity inside the game. You're empowered and rewarded by making good food choices with your character inside the game. Like they gain superpowers, mm -hmm. uh, they make more friends, I don't know, whatever, whatever structure it is. So you can make an internal identity and narrative wrapped around a practice. And that practice can mirror the real world practice. Um, then your challenge is transfer. 
right? So someone, like lots of people can become, you know, global billionaires in investment savings games, um, but then still will max out their credit card, max out their credit card every month, right? So, so because there isn't there isn't a sense of urgency of transfer for the practice from from the game space out of the game space. So transfer is often uh, a big part of the mystery and is a challenge that you really need to think about. Like what are you know? So one of the things I said that's really nice is right. There's a ton of a curriculum and tools that are all about how to unpack a game experience and talk about it and apply it back to thinking about the games. Uh, in a new in inside your life, and why that information is relevant to you as a person. Um, I'm sorry. One more thing, because yeah, yeah. the other version, yeah, I heard. Yeah, so much sorry. To say. <laughs> Just yeah. reading out loud. Don't worry. The other version <laughs> is to try and do. Uh, we'll call them gamification strategies around uh, incentivizing you to do the actual behaviors in real life, right? So Fitbits uh, and um, uh, the Weight Watchers app, uh, you know, with points, etc. Right. And those can be extremely impactful. Uh, when people bring the right amount of weight of intrinsic motivation to play, when they're like, I really want to lose weight, and they have a tool that like, can be a gamified tool, uh, they can have tremendous results, right? So it's a totally different strategy, though, because you're not being like, I need to teach you the practice, and then you will pick it up and put it into the real world. It's mm -hmm. more like, I'm figuring out way posts for your actions in the real world. Um, and so those are, those are two very different strategies. They make two very different types of games. Uh, and they have different uh, different pros and cons. OK, that's my thought. I'm sorry, Gary. I'm just a new vocab term here. Dispositional change is what we're really talking about here. And so when we look at assessing games or assessing impact, um, the dispositional change, right, that transfer to, to make something happen is kind of like the moment of a game. Um, it's also very, very hard to test for and track. It would require longitudinal stuff, mm -hmm. you know, long into like, will my 12-year-old playing this game vote when they're 18? There are so many factors beyond that game that they just played right. that will influence that. But at the same time, we want to be able to be one of those factors. So, you know, dispositional change is at the core of our goals at iCivics because we're making citizens. We're, we're creating these people that you don't have to be 18 to have agency, but you know we want them to both like start to learn and explore their agency um, in K through 12, 4 through 12, whatever, and then really kind of execute it as a full-fledged citizen at 18 out in the world. And we get lots of questions about that, and there's never enough data, there's never enough studies, never enough funding for studies to get to dis dispositional change, but that's really, I think, the goal of any good learning game anyway, is whatever you're learning, you want to you hold you know, mm -hmm. deeply, so. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so another question, um, this one's from uh, G. Martin uh, from our YouTube chat, uh, and he asks, or he or she, or whomever G is, um, asks, have you worked with any research groups to determine your game's impact on student learning? And we did get a couple of questions earlier about whether or not um, and how you work with uh, subject experts, politicians, um, civics, experts and so just curious um, if and how you do that yeah so for iCivics uh, if you go to the iCivics website they've got a nice little section of a variety of different studies that have been done on a variety of different mm -hmm. games in their suite uh, I think one of the coolest ones um, was around drafting board mm -hmm. yes as drafting board uh, we did a research round around that uh, with the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Circle at Tufts University was yeah. our research partner. And uh, the cool thing about that is not only did it have the best impact out of that round of funded projects, but the rigor that went into it mm -hmm. was also considered the best research. Yep. So we got a blue ribbon with then like another blue ribbon stuck <laughs> on top of it. So that was a really, uh, a really cool And drafting thing. board is a, a argumentative writing tool that really kind of helps kids process information, use reasons, uh, evidence-based reasoning to make an argument about some civic topic, right? Like high school mm -hmm. service requirements before graduation or electoral college is a topic. So, you know, we, when we have opportunities to do studies, um, we want to look at it like, again, does it work? Who does it work for? The other nice thing about drafting board is it doesn't matter about, um, 
race, income, like it was across the board successful. So those are the kind of things that we look for in studies. Um, I will say we'll never have enough studies done. We'll never have enough study partners to work with um, to that end for the research. As far as content area experts, um, we've been really lucky over the years to have both uh, civic education, government teachers kind of at the core of the creation of things. Um, we've also have a number of folks with law degrees, you know, because when it comes down to it, if we're having a debate over who can search your locker or not, that comes down to law, <laughs> like reading case studies. So, you know, those are kind of our two main functionalities and backgrounds. Uh, we also have partnerships um, with funders. For example, we have a game coming out about county government, mm -hmm. and we've worked really closely with the National Association of Counties about how to somehow take the diversity of over 3,000 counties in the United States and, and make it into where you can have types, right, and understand the county government system very clearly enough to make a game that's really engaging to get folks interested in local government. Yeah. So we really kind of, it all depends on the project, it all depends on the opportunities um, and the partners that we can create and, and, and find. Um, I've also had a couple politicians and politicians' wives say that they should be playing our games more. So <laughs> I'm gonna consider that a win. <laughs> That's great, uh, the true test. Yes. Um, okay, so we've got three more questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dan and Carrie. So uh, Jillian Morrison from Swinburne University um, asked a couple of questions. One about um, how you sort of market to parents, if, if you market to parents um, in addition to schools and classrooms. Mm -hmm. So are you doing anything to um, encourage parents to civics games and um, and what are some strategies if you do? I'll speak to you civics and you can maybe talk broader for yeah, building. Yeah. It's just we're kind of in two different spaces to that end. Um, what what we found is we don't directly market in a, in a direct intentional way I guess to parents but at the same time they're no, noticing that their kids are playing our games or that they're coming home to talk about stuff um, and we have a great social media department, I guess, of one, <laughs> but she's just amazing. And so she really does a great job with Facebook and, and doing social media outreach. And basically, um, if you know a teacher, they're probably also a parent, and they probably also have friends that are parents. And so there's a lot of kind of grassroots communication and marketing happening through that realm. Um, and I get emails from parents enough to know that they are aware of what we're doing, they are aware that the kids are playing our games, and they oftentimes want to learn more um, and play themselves. Um, another kind of element of this group is the, the parent-teacher hybrid, which is the homeschool um, yep. scenario, insane, right? Yeah. And we are really well situated to be used in homeschool scenarios because, again, it's free. Um, we provide a full curriculum, and it's got computer and paper and all kinds of things. And it really, the lesson plans, since a lot of civic teachers, not a lot, but with changes in legislation in different states, you might have a geography teacher that's been in the classroom for 20 years, all of a sudden we move to civics, right? Just because you're in social studies does not mean mm -hmm. that you know all these areas, or you're comfortable with teaching these areas, right? You don't have a, a PhD in government studies to do this. Um, and so what the lessons try to do also is facilitate the instruction of these things and also facilitate background and content knowledge for the teachers parents as well. So again, I hear enough to know that like, even though we may not be targeting them as a unique user group, they're hearing the messages, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for Filament, um, it's complicated, because uh, Filament as a game development studio has a bunch of different outlets, so mm -hmm. a lot of, most of our work is work for hire, uh, so organizations approach us and ask uh, to partner with us to make a thing. Uh, and some of those things are for consumer or parent uh, or school, mm -hmm. uh, so that the, ch the market changes constantly for the products we're making on the work for hire side. Um, on, in terms of Filament's own portfolio of published games over the Filament Learning Platform, um, we really focus on schools. Um, there's nothing in there stopping you as a parent from buying licenses. We offer uh, individual licenses, but uh, uh, well, that's the nature of focusing. When you focus yeah. on a thing, that means you don't focus on the other things. So uh, we've really been pretty dedicated to the idea of trying to unlock the puzzle of school sales. Um, and there are definitely competitors in the market in educational games that 
are looking directly at parents. Um, I think it's uh, like just in terms of like the competitive field, parents are obviously a huge market. Um, you have to compete more directly in places like app stores, which are so risky and so dangerous and so expensive to like persist in. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a tough place to sort of uh, it's a very dangerous place to say I'm going to make a thing and then it's going to succeed, mm -hmm. uh, right? So one thing we like about uh, the school market is that it's really seems to be about keeping conversations going and building relationships. Uh, it sort of seems to be how to define moving the market there, and we like those things. We like we like relationships and conversations. So. Yeah. So those, it's been a better fit for us so far. So yeah. Oop. Great, thank you guys. All right, the final question, um, and then we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, Linda Shand uh, just asked in our YouTube chat. Discussed cognitive and that behavioral objectives. What about the affective domain? Um, so. That's, that is all she asks. Um, can you speak a little bit to, to that? And I'm not totally sure how, I guess, uh, affecting other types of changes, not just cognitive and behavioral. Yeah, so I think I'm looking at the question, so, so good choices. Oh, there she is, yeah. yeah. Good choices are effective slash value. So I think this is about, uh, I, I may be misinterpreting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to jump on the grenade. Give a, yeah, give it a try. <laughs> this is about sort of evaluating choices uh, rather than just uh, do you know how to do the thing or are you getting yourself in the habit of doing things? But like, how do you think about and value things? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. I don't have, I'll have to assemble something as I go here. Um, games are great at creating spaces where you get to build uh, that type of opinion and valuing. But the way they do that is usually by making a lateral space, where they say, here are a variety of tools that you could use to solve the problem. Maybe some are obviously good, maybe some are obviously bad, but most of them, oh, food choices. Oh, OK, see, I saw food choices. <laughs> I thought you meant good choices. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. Okay. Good food, maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. So, okay. I, it's, I think that means that I'm sort of on track, though. So that's good. Um, so yeah. So games often give you lateral choice spaces uh, where you have a variety of ways to accomplish something, and it's up to you not only to choose which one you think is best, but also decide on what metrics you consider best to be. Uh, some genres of games are better at that than others. So I think uh, role-playing games often have a lateral uh, effective space. Uh, competitive or trading card games often do, where you sort of have to decide on an opinion of what type of strategy you most enjoy using. And that then informs a bunch of choices about what cards you would use. So I think games are good at making uh, those spaces to encourage value choices. I don't know how great they are at enforcing value choices, because that's actually uh, that enforcing or trying to encourage particular choices past that is actually the opposite of the agency that led to the lateral thing feeling compelling in the first place. Um, to, so, so maybe to draw a further parallel to card games, because that's the example I'm going to stick with, uh, when a competitive card game space is too narrow and people feel like they must use one of maybe three or four particular decks, even though there's a whole bunch of other choices of cards that might be fun or interesting or flavorful or uh, whatever it is, when, when the, the game's strategic space gets too tight, uh, people really, really drop out and they're like, this is no fun, there's no space for me to be creative and make my own choices, I'm obligated to play um, Agro Shaman. I've now revealed I've been talking about Hearthstone the whole time, everybody. Yeah, I'm just, Can't be helped. I'm just talking about my pain about Hearthstone. <laughs> yeah, but no, anyway. Um, 
So yeah, so I think games can address it. They can create the system. And, and obviously there's room to discuss and think about it. Um, but the more prescriptive it is about how you make those value judgments, uh, the more it won't feel like a, an effective space. And I have to say from a service perspective, this is a challenge that we deal with all the time. Um, we give you the opportunity, if you're gonna run as a congressman or a senator or be the president, to pick a party to run with, and then you're kind of living in that space of that party. And so we give as much like area that you can kind of play around with and make value judgments, but there's also some judgments that are pre-made for you based on your selection of a party or an approach. Um, and that's sometimes where we get the most heat from users. And my response is always, if I get the same amount of Democrats and Republicans mad at me, Okay, first, that's, that's, that's not a bad thing. And two, um, we always say with the replayability, it's like these games are really, and I always say this in the game guides and everything else that we do, like play both sides. You can never really understand the system unless you, you kind of look at both sides and have to work with the values and ideas of those sides because a lot about what makes government systems kind of tricky and, and icky for some people are those values. And so we don't shy away from them, but we also don't force them you have agency, you have opportunities to make selections. So that, that for at least the way I'm understanding it, is a big part of what we do mm -hmm. and a big part of why unpacking gameplay and talking about what challenged you or what, what did you feel was easier for you. Mm -hmm. Was it easier to play as one party or another? Or is it easier to work with this value over that value? Um, that's where kind of the meta space around the game is where uh, like so much of the deeper kind of ownership of the learning can happen, mm -hmm. um, which is why games are awesome. You know, I think an interesting detail from the world of Icevics is uh, Lawcraft, mm -hmm. which is a game we've been actually rediscussing here in the shop. Um, Lawcraft, you're putting together a law, um, and there's actually a political value framework inside the game. It breaks uh, each each individual line of the bill can wind up being positive or negative on one of six. I think so. Yeah, so there's like three core aspects of sort of governmental philosophy when we make inverses. But just building the framework, right? Just being like, hey, there are values that go into laws is controversial. Yep. And people are like, I don't like your definition. I don't like your structure. I'm frustrated that I like that word for what I think is over here. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's good. And maybe. talking about it yeah. is, is the result that we can best possibly ask for. I mean, yeah. like, again, the game's never a silver bullet for anything. Mm -hmm. but. I shouldn't say that on a games for change conversation, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, but but what it does do is if you can capture that moment and use it, um, that's really in any game. If it's about food, if it's about civics, if it's about values, if it's about um, you know all kinds of great things that games for change games do. Right, take that moment, run with it, talk about it, make it an interpersonal opportunity, and then you double down on something that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan and Carrie, for spending so much time with us this afternoon. Um, I hope it was as fruitful for our audience as it was for us at Games for Change, listening to um, all of your great insights, um, not just throwing cheese curds, but <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> so uh, so thank you. And, and I want to point everybody who's, who's tuned in to um, the Filament Games podcast, which is one of my personal favorites. Yeah. Um, episode 16 features Carrie. So if you didn't get enough of Dan and Carrie uh, today, yeah. go yeah. 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 listen or download. And uh, yes. season, I think we'll be kicking up recording for a new Filament Games podcast season, and I think within the month. Awesome. Yeah, so Great there'll be more you. coming soon. Cool. And a quick plug for Games for Change, of course. Um, our Games for Change festival this summer. Um, just opened up our ticket sales. And so if you go to gamesforchange.org slash festival, you can read about the uh, 2017 program, our brand new VR for Change Summit, which we're really, really excited about, and, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully sign up to attend. Um, so that festival is happening July 31st to August 2nd uh, this summer. I will be there, Sarah. Good to hear. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. And again, if your question for some reason was missed or didn't get answered today, feel free to get in touch with us um, and we will get back to you. So thank you, Dan and Carrie. And bye, everybody. See you next yeah, time. Thank you so much, everyone. It was fun. Bye. Yeah.